think the actual superpower of this country is that everyone wants to either live in America or visit America for holidays or be friends and allies with America. No one is moving to China for a better life. No one is moving to Russia other than Steven Seagal for a better life. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's your superpower. All players, low down. John, welcome back to the show. Around here, we uh, we tend to focus on a lot about defense technology, processes of how it gets developed, selected, funded, used, all that stuff. It's basically the business of defense. Obviously, because with the merger, we make sense of defense in an enjoyable way. But context matters. And understanding national security means you have to have some kind of understanding of all of the other moving pieces that make national security a thing. And so... I am glad that John Fowler from International Intrigue has fenced off some time to come back on the show. It's been a while, uh, so welcome back, first of all. Thank you very much. Yeah, it has been a while. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the last time I was on, but uh, but yeah, thrilled to be back as well. Yeah, I got I got a ton of feedback uh, from you, John. Good, I hope. And the last time you're on, it's been six months. I had to go look it up. Six months and huge, huge response. Like, what a... What a great episode. We talked about a variety of topics. We spent a lot of time in South America and with China, uh, if I remember right. right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, China, 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 if you're in national security right now, uh, we have stuff going on in, in Ukraine with Russia. We have the Houthis in the Red Sea. We have the stuff going on in Israel. Like the world at times seems it's like it's on fire. <laughs> sure does. I mean, particularly the areas we focus on that matter. It does It does feel like there's uh, just like a nonstop barrage of of I mean, bad news. Let's just be, let's be frank, bad news. Yeah. So the, the one thing that I do use to kind of keep my head straight of what's going on in the world is international intrigue. So John, can you just reiterate from, uh, to our audience, like what this thing is and how amazing it is? That's kind of you to say that I, I, we've got a very similar mission to you, I think in our lane, which is kind of making geopolitical news, global news, enjoyable and accessible. So it's a five-minute daily newsletter written by former diplomats. So my colleagues and I kind of scour the news uh, right around the world for the stuff that we think matters the most. Then we keep you up to date on it. And we also add a little bit of our take on it. So based on our experience, based on being in some of these rooms, we kind of tell you what we think is going on and why it matters. Um, five minutes, ideally it's enjoyable and engaging. We, we try to throw a few jokes in there, although as we just said, that's not always the easiest thing to pull off when you're writing about, you know, the, the cavalcade of bad news. But uh, yeah, well, I think you'll enjoy it if, if folks sign up. One of the things that I actually used for the merge um, was a practice that, that International Intrigue had, which was, you know, here's the news and then you have, here's our take of like, what, what's, here's our take of what matters about the thing that you just read. And so it's, it's objective. So it's straight down the middle objective, like here are the facts and then here are the considerations um, which isn't necessarily always in the news. So I appreciated that and I have adopted it into, uh, into the merge for the newsletter. So thanks for that. Well, I mean, you're very welcome. And, and it's, I'm glad you have because, um, you know, the, the thing that separates folks like you and, and us and, and, and there are others out there too, is that we're not journalists per se. We're folks who practiced what we're talking about. We, we've seen behind this, this, this sort of the screens as it were. Um, and we've lived that life. So I think people are interested in kind of those little anecdotes or, or our observations. So I'm glad, I'm glad you have done it. I, I mean, obviously, you know, this, I love the merge and I read it regularly because defense is not my sort of natural area. So it keeps me across stuff I need to know as well. The other thing, which I, I'm not sure I'll ever integrate it for, for those of you, when you think of like geopolitical situations, international relations, it's obviously a worldview on things. There's a lot of things going on in the world. If you're not too good at geography, the other thing about this is the map. Every day there's the People map and it, it has the pins of where these topics are in the world. And so it allows you to kind of put a framing of where, what region are we talking about and what, what are the things going on in that region of the world? So they're not just, you know, words in an email, but they're actually have a, associated with a map. So I do really appreciate that. I've learned a little bit about, more about geography than, uh, than I did before I was reading it. So <laughs> People love maps. It really helps contextualize things. I, uh, I love maps as well. <laughs> do you follow the terrible maps social media account yeah yeah it's fantastic oh legendary yeah. <laughs> terrible but, maps and there's some absolute shockers out there and some ones that you probably don't even realize why they're bad you just sort of like 
the ones that you've kind of just seen a few times and you're like, oh yeah, that's just a map of X, Y, Z. And then they explain why it's bad. And you're like, oh God, it doesn't actually look anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's dig in. Let's start with China. And then uh, there's always a lot of stuff going on with China and then we can kind of go on from there. Uh, well, I don't know where you want to start. I guess the, the latest. What's up- going on with their economy? I mean, that's the last yeah. like two months or so. I know this is national security we're going to talk about, but you know, the economy drives a lot of those considerations. What, what is going on with their economy right now? That's a, it's a great question. It's hard to say. I think that the short answer is they are struggling to stimulate their economy. So they've got some real bad problems with debt in the real estate sector. I mean, folks may have seen some of the big Chinese real estate developers, and I'm talking enormous, like real estate developers that we can't really wrap our heads around here, you know, kind of having hundreds of millions of apartments going at any one time kind of thing. There's a couple of those in the last 18 months that have gone bust that have become, they have just sort of said, oh, we're not going to deliver on all the apartments that we were going to build. So they've got this huge problem in the property sector. It looks like consumption is, domestic consumption in China isn't coming back, even though arguably COVID's, you know, sort of the effects of COVID have gone in China and all that kind of stuff. But consumers are remaining pretty, I wouldn't say they're not spending, but they're just not spending at a rate that I think China needs them to, to kind of hit their growth goals. And that's the top line message is that they've set out five and a half percent growth again for the coming year. And and I think a lot of uh, analysts are like, we just don't know where you're going to get that. You've got debt problems, you've got low uh, spending problems. They don't look like they're going to put any stimulus into the economy. I think the big hope earlier this year was that that Beijing would sort of announce some big stimulus measures like they have in the past, but they haven't done that because they're concerned about debt. They're concerned about other things. So the economy is an unknown. It's not going well. I think interestingly to sort of link the security element of it, I think Xi Jinping has kind of realized that one of the big problems, I don't think it's the only problem, but one of the big problems is the souring mood on China as a place to do business, to invest, and that the region is a place that's going to be stable kind of in the medium term. You know, last couple of years, I think everyone's kind of pretty spooked about the Taiwan stuff, about China's general adventurism in the region. Then obviously you couple that with what they did during COVID and and the general rhetoric coming out of Beijing, and a lot of money has pulled out of China. And, And that's kind of exacerbated the problems that the economy already has structurally. So one of the things you're seeing Xi Jinping do right now is is try to make nice with the world. You know, that was the Biden summit last year. He just he just had all these US CEOs in Beijing, uh, what, yesterday, I think, or two days ago it was. He's trying to kind of diffuse the tension a little bit in the hope that he can fix that bit of the economy, I think. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. Spooking businesses that want to work with China, the decoupling of those economies is... Uh, not good. Um, no. obviously it's like the world's top two economies, the closer they are working together, the more interest there is in preserving norms. And when you start messing with that equation, and I would argue China probably started at first, you know, every action uh, has a consequence or the, you know, as the meme says, you know, fuck around and find out. Exactly. <laughs> so they're starting to find out, I think with, uh, they're getting serious with decoupling a lot of the, uh, investments. I think the IP theft of joint ventures is another big part of it. And the real estate, real real quick, back to real estate. I was looking this up the other day and I had to read it a few times because like you said, the numbers are mind blowing. Yeah. Evergrande and Country Garden are the two that, that went bust. Evergrande was so big, it had $300 billion of debt. It, it's like if you took the entire... U.S. Air Force budget for the year and doubled it. That's how much money they had owed, and they were had all of these speculation loans. They were building apartment buildings, and yeah. when they restructured the way that they do loans in China about three or four years ago, uh, all of these buildings that needed financing, all they're all like half complete. So there's massive amounts of apartment buildings that are just hollow. And there's a cultural reason why there's a, a need to keep buying homes. Uh, so it's, it's a weird, the real estate thing is fascinating uh, to me when I look at it from China. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that it might sound a bit weird to kind of focus on real estate as like a you know geopolitical or security kind of thing. But if you think more broadly about what 
the Communist Party or what Xi Jinping particularly has done, but the Communist Party since like, let's say the mid nineties, the whole idea was to bring China from a really poor developing country into the middle class kind of middle income level. And part of that is, you know, it's, it's a little bit downstream of like that American dream idea of, okay, well, you know, you were living in, you know, in a rural village. Why don't you move into the city? Because there you can be more productive. You can contribute to the economy more. And part of that is we'll get you a place to live. So will develop the city, economic activity will come, and a little piece of that will be yours. We do this through these enormous companies that build, as you just say, like, and I, it's if people haven't been to China, it's kind of weird when you, you come from a Western country, um, particularly if you don't come from a giant city, just to see that like a sea of 100 story apartment buildings, just as far as the eye can see. But every apartment in that was supposed to be for a Chinese family and a, and a promise of a better life. And going bust, as you say, again, they've just simply said, oh, you know how you gave us your life savings to, to put a deposit down for that little bit, that little bit of paradise that you thought you'd have? Well, we, we're not going to be able to complete it now. And so it's more than just real estate and economics and wonky macroeconomics. It goes to like the structural societal harmony of the country. And the Communist Party is worried about it because if, if this is the future that they've brought in, i.e. companies going bust and taking people's life savings, that's a real problem for kind of how how much trust you have in how the country's being run, right? Yeah, and depending on what region you're at, northern and western regions, uh, regional corruption is a big issue. Oh yeah, and so thinking of like centralized planning, a centralized government is is how I'm going to get away from regional corruption. And then this happens to you, you know, you're starting to lose faith in different levels of the government that you're, you know, in the society that you're kind of living in. Absolutely. Speaking of China. Um, do you have any uh, any thoughts on the recent Taiwan elections? It wasn't hugely surprising. The election results kind of largely followed with the polls. I think there were, if you'd asked me this question maybe a year ago, when polls were suggesting the pro-Beijing uh, Guomindang, the, the KMT, were more likely to, or not more likely, but were super competitive in that race, uh, and you said to me that, oh, no, they didn't really get close, then then I would have been surprised. But I think I think what we saw last year was... Again, you have to separate two things out. One, Taiwanese domestic politics. I think there was a candidate kind of disparity. I think that the the candidates were put up that were put up were not of equal quality. I think the 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 KMT guy didn't do a great job of running a campaign. That vote also got split between the other party, which I f- forget the name of. Not the not the uh, party that won. T P P. Yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. The, that's third, the third party. party, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's DPP, which is one, KMT, and then TPP, I think. Right, yeah. I always get mixed up with all the acronyms, yeah. but the third party kind of took more votes from the KMT, I think, than, than the DPP. So that's the local bit. I think the geopolitical element of that is that last year's events um, kind of just, as long as as long as Taiwanese folks were could be confident that the DPP wasn't pushing for independence or pushing to like upend anything or was antagonizing Beijing. Again, Beijing kind of shot themselves in the foot by bellicose language about senior officials in the Chinese Communist Party were kind of like the rivers will flow red before we give up Taiwan. All this kind of like ridiculous yeah. classic revolutionary Communist Party nonsense that they throw out in in terms of like for a domestic audience. They heard mm-hmm. that in Taiwan. They're like, you know what? Like we, we can't risk that. Um, so as long as the DPP cleared that hurdle of just being like, hey, we're not trying to get independence. We're not trying to antagonize Beijing. But like, let's keep things how they are. I think it made it pretty easy for Taiwanese folks to to vote for that. Pretty stark choice they were faced with, I think. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I was going for. Like, I To me, it seemed like what, the, what parties and the polls were leaning, again, absence of the domestic politics. But when you look at the worldview, you go, well, the, the polling says it's leaning this way. And then 12 months later, yada, 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 all the stuff, more stuff going on with China. And like you said, the rhetoric, the polls are leaning the other way. And then, you know, the president who I think he'll be sworn in in a couple months, yeah. you know, he, he, he was a pro independence, like deep green guy. And he, obviously he's more center now, but he's pro U S relations and, uh, he's not for independence, but he's status quo. We're already independent. Therefore we don't need to declare independence. That exactly. was kind of the double speak that I remember. Yeah. And as long as he cleared that bar of kind of proving to people that 
you know, there was, I guess, the, I guess if, again, if you'd asked me a year ago, the big question would have been, can, can the DPP convince people that he's not pro-independence like he has said in the past? Can he clear that, that hurdle of saying, actually, my views have tempered and let's just keep going. And obviously he did pretty easily. So yeah, I, I mean, again, there's people always ask me when we're talking about China, it's like, why can't they, like, why would they do that? And it's the thing about the Communist Party, it's hard to understand that the, the messaging is so bad because they're really not interested in outside stakeholders. They're, they're getting better. They're getting better, I would say. But like the nature and the DNA of the, of the Chinese Communist Party is to communicate internally for its own power structures and for other Chinese counterparts. It's not good at massaging, diplomacy, all that kind of stuff that I, I think other countries are good at. And I think Xi Jinping is, you know, to his credit, I think he's realizing that and he's making efforts on, you know, kind of trying to get people to communicate China's story more effectively. But it's like a big company, right? Like if, if, you've, if you're a legacy company, it's really hard for you to innovate. It's in the DNA of, an, mm -hmm. of a human organization and you can't just immediately change the way you operate. And the way China, the Chinese Communist Party operates is they are not good at being like, oh, for the next year, don't say anything confrontational about Taiwan because we'll make things worse. It just takes one senior official to be, you know, in a bad mood. And he says, right, we're going to blow everyone up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's what you say and in, in diplomacy, and you know this, uh, better than, there's an art and science of not what you say, but what you don't say exactly. and the things that you do say, how you say it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you can say the right thing in the wrong way and be disastrous. And there's exactly. a, and you know, you look at presidential speeches, U.S. and foreign, there's all of the analysis of like, what is it when he said this? What was he actually referring to? And how, how bluntly did he say something? And uh, how much, how many times did he talk about this one topic? And so all of that art and science of a narrative when you, when you push things out in the analysis. And yeah, so some of the things in China are just like, uh, hey, did you? Did you mean to have the record button on when you said that? <laughs> exactly. And, and, on, on, and on the other hand, a lot of the tea leaf reading that folks do, like ch genuine China experts are very, very good at that. But no one knows. Like no one knows what's actually going on because there is absolutely no transparency in the upper echelons of how the party makes decisions. So you can have China scholars with 50 years of experience saying, here's my best guess. But, you know, in the US or in Australia or in the UK, you know, you have a, a heck of a lot more transparency. You have obviously a free press. And then you have this idea of declassification of files and, and decisions after a period of time. So you can go back and calibrate and sort of get this yeah. idea of, you know, 90% of the time when this happens, it means this. Obviously, there are outliers, but we can be fairly sure. We just don't have any of that with China, like really at all. Seems like a good tool for like, China GPT, you just feed in all the documents and right. go, what are they thinking? Yeah, well, that would be that would be a game changer. Yeah, exactly. A copyright trademark. There you go. Yeah. Twenty twenty four. No one can steal that idea. <laughs> go go build it, but we want. We, I mean, you get the yeah. rights. Give me a cut. Yeah. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. Uh, leave it to some other people. While we're in China, let's uh, let's go down to the South China Sea. Give uh, people who may not be as familiar, uh, besides the South China Sea being south of China in the sea. Uh, could you uh, could you give us like a tweet level summary of why is the South China Sea like just a powder keg and there's always things going on? The high level version of that is it's it's the kind of ocean off the off off the coast of the east and southern coast of China that unfortunately for the region has about I think I think it's fourteen neighboring states have some claim to a portion of that that sea so there's a lot of territorial overlap. Um, and, and, you know, maritime boundaries are famously difficult. Uh, the UN has set up a, a whole body of law and, and institutions to kind of deal with those, those disputes and they mostly work well, but in, in this particular one, the South China Sea is also, you know, potentially very rich in resources and, and all these kinds of things. So you have this like natural classic, almost like if you just imagine Europe in the 1800s, but kind of in the sea now that's kind of like what it looks like it's a ton of competing claims over a potentially very resource rich area but the wrinkle on all of that is that about well, again don't quote me on this but it's about 15 years ago i would say around about 2010 maybe a little after that china's obviously made an internal policy to claim mostly 
the whole sea for itself uh, under something they call the nine dash line, which is not plausible. I'll just say that out there. I try to be very balanced in everything I say, but it's the idea that they had some old maps somewhere where someone claimed that the whole thing had been traditionally China's. So now it was traditionally China's and they literally drew nine dashes on a map around the bit that was theirs. And it goes like way down to the coast of Vietnam and almost into Indonesia. And it, I mean, it's like way, way out there. That'd be like the United the States thing. drawing a nine dash line around the entire Gulf of Mexico up yep. to like the Yucatan Peninsula. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's pretty, pretty out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so obviously that's created tensions in the region. Philippines particularly have um, had a lot of problems because they have some, some islands that, or some, not even islands, really, right? Like they're kind of like rock structures and shoals and reefs that are sometimes above the water, sometimes below. And that brings in a whole element of international law, which is is fairly complicated. But when I was there in 2016, the Philippines took China to uh, under the, uh, you know, uh, very, very sort of deep wonk, but there's a UN convention on the law of the sea. They they took them to the, to the UN courts and then they got a, a, a a judgment from the UN saying, actually, these features are yours under international law. They're not China's. Obviously, China didn't recognize that. So, you know, that that's kind of the the broad the broad brush thing is that China wants it all. Other countries say it's not yours. International law says it's not yours. And and so they they kind of constantly send their coast guards out there to harass fishing vessels and they're building military installations on on reefs and all this kind of stuff. What you see in the in the press lately with the Philippine uh, Navy and Marine Corps and the Chinese fishing vessels and the Chinese quote Coast Guard way way out. It's the second Thomas Shoal. That's the region which is to me is like fascinating. It's like the powder keg, and and the story goes like this. Uh, and John, you, you're you're probably very familiar with this. When the all this territorial dispute started between China and the Philippines in this region in the in the 90s, the Philippines was like, there's no way that we can maintain this presence over this submerged thing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to purposely ram this huge ship into the submerged reef, and we're just going to use it as a military outpost. So there's a ship called the Sierra Madre, and it's been stuck on this reef since 1999. And there's a contingent of about a dozen Philippine Marines who live on it. And when you see the, the all the news, it happens about every 45 to 60 days, there's this conflict with the Philippines uh, Philippine Navy and and the Chinese um, Navy or Chinese Coast Guard. It's it's because of the resupply to keep these dozen people like on this rusted out hunk of a ship that's stuck on this reef to maintain the territorial claim. But it, it is a fascinating you know twenty five year ordeal that happens about every forty five or sixty days in the news. It's to me it's fascinating. It's it's wild and I mean it's even it even goes like. An installation of kind of soldiers, you can go like, oh, well, you know, soldiers, soldiers. But it's sometimes they have tiny little fishing boats that the Chinese, giant Chinese Coast Guard goes and harasses these fishing boats, kind of saying to the Philippines, oh, they're crossing into Chinese territorial waters and how dare they. And and I, I would encourage folks listening to this, just like to Google Second Thomas Shoal that you just mentioned, because we'll put it in the YouTube video. So yeah. if, you're, if you're listening to this on audio, go look at the YouTube channel. And right now, as I'm talking, I'll, I'll put a bunch of videos and clips over. You can see like where this thing is, how close it is to the Philippines and the, the size of the ship that's just rusted out stranded there and then how tiny the resupply ships are. And then these massive Chinese vessels with water cannons that are just shooting like firefighting level, like water pressure at these fishing vessels. Yeah. The U S uh, I'd say Western media does a good job of trying to propagate that when it does happen. So everyone is aware, put some sunlight on it, but it's not deterring the actions. I think that's a good point because one of the things that Australia used to do, and I, 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 there was a generally like a multinational task force, US and I think the Brits as well from time to time, would sail our warships through the South China Sea because you have you know the right of free passage and you know international transit and all that kind of stuff under international law, and it would always get massive rebukes from the Chinese. But the idea is that if you can show that you consistently consider that international waters that you're transiting through territorial waters, but quickly, all these things consistently done over time show that the international community has never considered these areas as Chinese territorial waters. What the Chinese are trying to do by kicking out the Philippines, they're not trying to start a war with the Philippines per se, but what they're trying to do is show that we have exerted control over these regions. And look, we have proven that we're able to project our power out to these places. And the Philippines have given, like, 
in their dreams, the Philippines have given up coming into our waters because they accept that they're our territorial waters. And this has been going on for five, 10 years. And you can't deny that it's Chinese waters. And the Philippines are saying like, no, these are ours. So we're going to keep doing this because you can't deny us, you know, our passage. Um, and then they're using Coast Guard boats, I think largely because they don't want it to look like they're using Navy boats because that's far more antagonistic than Coast Guard, yeah. which is like, oh, Coast keeping, Coast Guard. Yeah, yeah, keeping the order, you know, like we're here to help kind of vibes. But that's again, right. folks should look at the, there's YouTube videos of, of these ships that they're clearly like frigate sized ships with, um, you know, ostensibly the cannons being just replaced with, as you say, water cannons. Um, and, and there was actually a great video recently of a, of a rear admiral in the Filipino Navy getting hosed by one of these coast guards and it just shattered all of the glass on the bridge. Like, so that like, we're talking serious, serious, powerful, uh, water cannons that, that sink a lot of the, fi the fishing ships and have done. So I think it's one of those things that there's enough consistent behavior from both sides that the Chinese know what the Filipinos are going to do or what the, you know, and it, it really is the Philippines most often kind of having these confrontations, but the Chinese know how it's going to go. The Philip, the Philippines, they know how it's going to go. So even though it looks dramatic and it is definitely, I think China in the wrong, as long as it remains consistent, we're not going to see it escalate, but that's the big if, right? Like it doesn't take a yeah. ton for political calculations on one side to change and for a shot to get fired. And then, and then who knows what's going to happen. You think that's one of the reasons that this has lasted for so long without any third party intervention? It's a good question. I think, I think everybody's that, that kind of tops most people's lists of, of terrifying hotspots in the world that haven't obviously yeah. blown up. Like, I mean, we, we sit there and say, Oh, Gaza and Israel, and that's, you know, horrific and a massive hotspot in Ukraine and Russia. And, Absolutely. But I think this one is a one that everyone's kind of like, we really don't want to find out what happens if there's a war in the South China Sea. I mean, not just because China is a huge power, not just because there are 14 countries in the region, plus a ton more with naval vessels and interests, but because it's where so much of global shipping goes through, right? Like oh, the, yeah. the, the effects to the world economy, if you think that there's been effects to the world economy from Russia invading Eastern Ukraine, which definitely had effects because of, you know, wheat and grain and the Black Sea and whatever. It is unfathomable what would happen to global shipping if a hot war broke out in the South China Sea. So, so I think one, predictability. Two, the resources in the South China Sea are a little bit esoteric still. You know, we haven't sort of got a giant extractable kind of, you know, oil reserve or anything like that. Or, at scale anyway, that people are fighting over or there's not something that I think is unknown that everyone's gone, Oh my God, we've got to get this straight away. The fishing resources are important, but they're kind of by their nature, longer run kind of extractable resources. You can't sort of lay claim to them all immediately at once. So all of these things kind of lend themselves to a longer time horizon. Again, hopefully that's the way it stays. Because again, as I say like it doesn't take much for, someone in Beijing to decide, right, we're going to show the Philippine Navy, give them a real good scare and, and we're going to fire something across the bow and it goes wrong and they sink a Navy ship in the Philippines. At, you know, it doesn't take much for that to happen, I guess is what I'm saying. There's a saying in Washington, D.C., show me your budget and I'll show you your priorities. Right. <laughs> if you look at the region right now, um, whether it's northeast or south of China, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan and the Philippines, like all of them have massive increases in defense spending Yep, and it's getting bigger. And I think Brunei is actually the standout. I was, I was looking at this, uh, I think I put it in the merge last week. I can't remember 32% increase in defense spending. Like they are deathly afraid of, the, of what's going on in the South China Sea. Yeah. And, and I don't blame them. I mean, I'm only really sort of intimately familiar with Australia's decisions on that, on that front. And ours is kind of designed to sort of give us kind of long range deterrence, I think. Um, and I suspect that's probably what most defense budgets in the region have designed as well, because no one can really hope to outspend or outcompete China in a kind of power projection sense. It's more of a denial sense. Right. But I, I mean, you'd be, you'd be almost negligent or, or, you know, certainly asleep at the wheel if you weren't doing that in the region, because if you if you have economic interest in the South China Sea, 
it, they will come under some threat in and I, and I should say it's it's not just China that's doing this. China is obviously the the ninety five percent person, the you know, country that's yeah. doing this. But Vietnam has conflicts with with its regions, uh, with China particularly, and like genuine conflicts, not China being bolshy. So there's just a, it is the analogy with Europe in the eighteen hundreds is probably not a great one, sort of if you drill down into it. But it's a nice kind of like, you know, just quick thing to think about. Oh, okay, so you had a ton of resources in a ton of countries, and we don't really know how it's going to play out, but we think probably something bad's going to happen. If you then shift to to how you can stop that from happening, you know, I think the approach of at least Australia and the US and, and like-minded countries has just been, as I said, that consistent behavior of, nope, this isn't yours. It's free. It's international. We're going to keep the status quo because that's been working for ages. Let's just, you know, get all the regional Southeast Asian countries on board with the idea that the status quo suits everybody and that if we collectively just keep this line and push back against China, we don't get upset. We don't get belligerent. We don't try and force them to, you know, back off or whatever. We just consistently advocate. The idea is, I guess, you can just keep the status quo going indefinitely, but who knows? Coalitions and consensus on norms is, I think, a pretty valuable thing that we don't really pay Absolutely. well we you pay attention to it i probably don't pay attention to it as much you have uh you, you mentioned one of them which is uh, ASEAN, uh which i forgot how many countries are in that you have a lot of bilateral agreements but everyone has their own little interesting interests in the region there's a there's a regional um we were talking about this the other day search of the b i can't pronounce there's a regional forum that's coming up oh, the right? bowel the bowel forum that's coming up yeah okay, what is that Bowel is a town i think in hainan on the island of Hainan, but it's, it's anyway, it's down there, um, somewhere in South China, basically. And it's kind of China's version of attempt to try to stand up kind of like a Davos style summit. The idea of like regional economic leaders and business people and countries will send people to kind of a, I think it's a week long. Again, this, this is all stuff that you're dredging up from my memory of, of when I was a diplomat in Beijing and we used to always have to cover the Boao Forum, but it was always seen as a bit of like a, oh yeah, we should be there because Xi Jinping used to go and, and they used to put, the Chinese used to put like some considerable political capital behind trying to get it up to, to international status, but no one really ever took it that seriously. Um, but it, you know, it's, it is still what it is. Like they put a lot of money into it and they try to, they try to sort of say, hey, China's the leading power in this region and we're going to have a conversation about infrastructure investment economic policy uh and all the stuff that davos as you know essentially does um, i think that's coming up this week or maybe yeah next week maybe yeah yeah i think it's coming up soon you're right yeah next couple of days and I, and I know that i know that the reason or one of the reasons that uh for folks who didn't catch this story um we covered it in international intrigue uh this morning the Xi Jinping met with a bunch of US CEOs in Beijing, a surprise meeting where he kind of said, you know, lucky you, you get to meet with me at the last minute. Uh, as kind of a, a, you know, we talked about at the start, this idea of him trying to warm up relations with international investors because of the Chinese economy, but also because he's not going to go to Boao this year. Uh, so he doesn't want to see, he doesn't want to, I don't think he wants to project that China is taking economic development in the region less seriously, even though he's not going. Uh, so he was kind of like, oh, I'll meet with US CEOs instead. And hopefully that will, you know, I'll say, oh, we, you know, and we're looking forward to hosting the Boal Forum. It's very important without actually having to go. But I think it also shows that they, their, their kind of efforts to get that to be a, a global phenomenon have largely failed, even though they'll still do it. You know, a little bit of a saving face. 100%. Yeah. Like you yeah. just kind of slowly back away and like each year you just kind of let it fall to a natural level and you don't ever say it's failed but you don't kind of put too much effort into it either that's my sense there may be there may be folks who actually have a deep understanding of what goes on there that that disagree with me but i know from a political level australia was always kind of like oh god we have to send someone don't we can we not send the prime minister can we send someone less serious and less serious and less serious <laughs> you know that that was kind of our approach to it it's like one of those parties you look at the RSVPs and you go, can I level up, level down? Like how do exactly. I calibrate this? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let's talk about Russia and uh, what's going on with uh, Ukraine. Well, I mean, it's still going on. I think last yeah. time we recorded, it was going on. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I don't, 
recall specifically where we were at the last time we chatted, but it, it, well, let's talk about the domestic side of it. Cause that's really where I think the sticking point is for, uh, for us. It's, it, it went from a, a political issue into a deeply divisive political issue over the course of you know, the last six to nine months. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm pretty staunchly apolitical, particularly when it comes to U S politics. Um, you know, I think folks want hot takes on, on that stuff. There's plenty of places they can go, but I think it's pretty clear that that, that change has been led by, by Donald Trump and his views on, on the conflict and, and America's involvement. And I think you saw that clash kind of happen with Mitch McConnell, right? When he was making, yeah. I think some pretty personally, I find his arguments pretty compelling about, you know, this is a chance for the U S defense industry to kind of level up and kind of, you know, invest in itself. And we don't have to really spend you know, U S soldiers lives on kind of doing this. Um, and we get to support a Western ally and all this kind of stuff at the same time. Like those arguments to me are fairly, I think that would have been fairly mainstream, you know, not that, not that long ago with, within political defense kind of establishment in the U S but I, you know, I think Donald Trump has a very different view about America's role in the world. So he's kind of remarkably been able to change that turn this into a kind of maybe not fully partisan, but at least a, a good, a good wing of us politics against it. What's interesting is, is what it changes about the U S election in November, that it's very, it's now oh, yeah. very clear that for Ukraine and for Europe, one candidate would be better than the other. And I don't know that that's kind of been true before about the U S I think that it's been such a bipartisan thing in U S politics that the, you, you I mean, you may have, issues on the margins and one party may want to do this a bit more than the other party, but largely the European slash Western European allies kind of didn't have to worry too much about who was going to win the white house. But I think that's pretty different this year, right? Yeah. And the, and the politics of, uh, of how the, these spending bills are put together. Well, well first of all, I mean, we're recording this at the you know, end of March. By the time it comes out, it'll be early April. Whatever does, whatever spending may pass um, out of Congress, it'll, it'll be the only thing that passes before the election. Yep. Yeah. It'll, and so it's a huge bill, like big, big bill. The U.S. has spent a total so far of about $75 billion in aid and about $46 billion is military related. That's from the beginning of the invasion to about right now. And there's a $95 billion aid package that's in Congress. 60 billion of that is in Ukraine. So this one bill would almost double the entire amount of aid. And so it's a big, big bill. That's not all that's in the bill though, which is one of the issues. There's also about $14 billion that's going to Israel yep. for military aid. And then 9 billion to Gaza for humanitarian relief, which is another function of dysfunctional politics, how we can give weapons to one side and relief on the other and let it play out, uh, which is a whole different issue. We want to talk about Israel and Gaza. Uh, that thing passed the Senate, but it's stalled in the house. And then there's a, there's another one where it's like, Hey, we're going to give you just Ukraine money. We're going to take all the Israel and Gaza stuff out of it, but we're going to put border security money in there. And so the, the border security, being in one bill and not in the other has become like this domestic politics, which is, uh, which is unfortunate for, for obviously everyone in Ukraine right now. Even just trying to unravel that you kind of point to the problem, right? That like, if, if you're not bipartisan on, on the, these issues, how can you attach, how can you put Ukraine aid, Israel aid and a border bill in the same thing and expect it to pass or, you know, have any hope that it will pass cleanly. It's just so many issues on which everybody has, so many opinions. And then, as you said, you, you're raising the kind of domestic issues of, of, of Jewish constituencies versus kind of isolationist re Republicans. It's, it's a mess. And I think, you know, obviously US politics isn't what we do at International Intrigue, but I think if you zoom out and kind of understand what the world thinks when they look at that, if I'm honest, I think diplomats are very good at sort of sitting back and kind of just being like, listen, let the news, let the headlines hyperventilate, let the politicians say what they need to say to get their votes and appease their billionaire backers and all that kind of stuff. But like, let's look at the long time trend lines and, and, and the core interests because, you know, most of the time folks will act as we expect them to. But I do think that Europe 
particularly Europe, look at what's going on in American politics. And they have their hyperventilations. You know, I was just in Europe and I was just in London and everyone's going, oh, American politics, how can you live there? You know, the guns and all this kind of stuff. And that's fine. Everyone, everyone, <laughs> everyone always that's says a, that, right? That's such an English thing to say. Yeah. It's such an English thing to say. And, you know, I, fair enough. I respect their views. But the, yeah. the idea is that they always used to say that. But I think they always kind of, that was the hyperventilating. But at the end of the day, they were like, listen, Americans are great and they will let work we're together we're the same people essentially and Europeans largely think the same as well and I honestly think that they now look at it and they don't know it's not just like oh American politics is so crazy it's Obama versus McCain or it's you know Sarah isn't Sarah Palin wacky it's kind of like oh it, it, you know there are two very different possibilities for what how America will approach the world post November. There really are. And it's not, it's not hyperbole to say that. And I'm not saying one is better than the, other. well, I have my views, but you know, you can, you can think what you want to think, but what that does is it makes other countries hedge a lot more. And that means that then they're less kind of in America's orbit. Or they're, they're less committal, right? Like by definition, exactly. a hedge is like, so you don't commit to something. <laughs> and if the if the enduring power of the United 100%. States over China, when you look at like strategic competition is alliances, that is the number one asymmetric advantage the United States has. Over Russia, over Iran, over China. Yeah, it's yeah. that's it. That's the one thing. It's not, hey, we have more weapons than them or hey, our, we have more airplanes than them. It's the coalition. Yep. And I think that's pretty an apolitical yep. statement. Um, whether what party you're at, like just ob objective analysis about foreign relations, diplomacy, strategy, like the rise and fall of nations, like being a good neighbor and having, you know, some friends in the neighborhood is the thing that, that ultimately you want, you know? So managing those relationships, fostering those relations and making sure that we have your back, you have ours. And, and that's why you have like, everyone's jumping into NATO right now because they have article five. So, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine. Everyone wants, wants to join NATO so they can have this, this uh, coalition that's going to have their back. Absolutely, I'm so glad you say that because I, I say that regularly to folks in, in America that I think that, you know, I live here and I love living here. And I think the actual superpower of this country is that everyone wants to either live in America or visit America for holidays or be friends and allies with America. And like people don't, you know, you obviously people have their views on it, but no one is moving to China for a better life. No one is moving to Russia other than Steven Seagal for a better life. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's your superpower. And I think, I think it, I think it is taken for granted a little bit. I, I also would say that I think it goes both ways. I think one, having a, an isolationist kind of instinct is probably not a bad thing for a country of such immense power. I think it should be reticent to use its power overseas. It shouldn't just be like, oh yeah, let's go do this, this, and this. And, you know, again, critics will say that America has traditionally been pretty, pretty quick to use its power overseas. But if you're a student of history, you know that you, you had to be dragged into World War II. You had to be dragged into things before that kind of post-World War II di dichotomy of, you know, I think America has been over, over its full history, fairly reticent to get involved on the world stage. Yeah. And, and the ones that it did, so it's interesting you mentioned that like World War One, World War Two, like they think it took a long time for the U.S. to get involved. They really tried to avoid it, really tried to avoid it. And then there was a the Cold War. I think the, the they went a little bit opposite with like brush fire conflicts. And like we can go around and, and stomp out these conflicts before they escalate. And then Vietnam was like, well, like we don't want to get involved, involved. And so we'll get like covertly involved for a little bit. And then that pulled us into that thing uh after the cold war you had like again your intervention period in the 90s where if there's something going on deploy the troops uh we'll we'll squash it you know you have these 45 day 60 day conflicts yeah and then after 9 11 obviously there's a lot of scar tissue of, of being in there for a generation so i think it ebbs and flows but for the big things that are you can see the writing on the wall like this is going to be a big thing like like being very deliberate of don't get involved unless you have an exit plan right exactly i mean even after world war ii i mean eisenhower when he was president was super skeptical of permanent u.s force in europe he wanted nato to stand on its own two feet and i mean 
that there's someone else right now who thinks NATO should stand on its own two feet and that European sh defense should stand on its own two feet. And I don't think that you would put him in the same category of, as Eisenhower when it comes to kind of, you know, statesmen. But you know, that that was the the idea. And then obviously Europe wasn't able to do it. So I think begrudgingly America was like, okay, well, as you said, brush fire policy of better stay involved and not let things escalate. But, you know, I, I digress a little bit from from your original point. I think you mentioned that America's kind of superpower is that it is has allies and friends. I think that's right. And I think, as we said, like the hedging, the problem of other countries who are traditionally really close to America having to hedge means that they spend time and effort developing their own kind of contingency plans. And maybe that survives a cycle or two, maybe, you know, 2016 to 20, folks were kind of willing to wait and just see if this was a, just a little bit of a kind of weird spasm in the American kind of body politic. But if, if there is a continued belief or even threat that America will genuinely withdraw from the world, then I think those kinds of sinews, the kind of defense cooperation, the budget appropriations, these kinds of things in other countries that have traditionally been America's friends, they start to change. And then you start to get a world that I think looks a lot more like what we talked about last time, which is this truly multipolar world where America has Australia, probably the UK, France and Germany to an extent, and maybe a couple of other countries in its orbit. And then you have maybe Turkey with a couple of its countries. You have Russia with its few, maybe Iran and China in a kind of vague orbit. And that world looks a lot less friendly to American interests in my view. The US, the UK and Australia AUKUS, I think is one of the key drivers for that. We're like, hey, we're going to openly share all of our technologies in these yeah. three pillars because we need a foothold in each region of the world. You guys are the are coming to the party. Notably, the one that's absent is in Northern Asia. So the talk of Japan potentially joining AUKUS down the road is is pretty interesting to me. Yeah, I think so. I think that's fascinating to me. Yeah, my, my grandfather, who who fought in the Pacific Theater in World War II, wouldn't wouldn't imagine that, no. that America yeah. and Australia Times and the UK have changed. Times have exactly, changed. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Times have changed, and, and and thank God for it. But yeah, I think it is. I think uh, the only the only question there is how comfortable Japan is with with sort of fully throwing its lot in with what would certainly be seen in China as anti-China forces. Not really prepared to talk too much about Japanese domestic politics, uh, but no, no. <laughs> nor am I an expert on it. But I do know uh, from their defense side, in the last year they set out to basically rebuild their entire military yeah. to be a national, not just a Japanese defense force, but an actual military, like long range strike, they're buying thousands of cruise missiles from the United States. Their defense budget is, I want to say it's like 17% increase this year, which is like really massive. And wow. they want to have a fully transformed military by 2027. So they have this five year plan to basically modernize their entire military force. Like, and that's largely a political in their country that they have a population problem. And so they're, they're divesting their fleets of helicopters and go into drones and just systemic shift of embracing what is going on in our neighborhood. We need to be able to protect ourselves. And if that means that we need to reach out and touch someone preemptively because we feel threatened and maybe that's what we end up doing. Maybe that's part of the defense kind of planning in, in those three countries to engage Japan like that, because it at least puts some ring fences around, like you're going to become part of our security alignment, whether it's as a full member, I, I don't think that's actually being kind of, mooted as a full member but kind of like a AUKUS tier two cooperation yeah, member be something like that whatever maybe, it yeah. is but that kind of gives the US Australia and the UK some kind of say in Japanese military decision making right like if we're going to connect our militaries we have to you know we have to have some kind of understanding of what you're going to do is the worst case scenario for the whole region is everyone acting on their own clearly we, we ended up in Japan and we started yes, in sorry. Congress and did a detour through the Middle East. I, I apologize. I, I, I'm liable to do no, that. I'm the one who brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear your, your last thoughts on Russia. Um, well, not last thoughts potentially, but <laughs> I was in a, I had a conversation not too long ago and it was about, it, it was back to the funding, you know, should, should we fund, should we give military aid to Ukraine or not? One of the talking points, it's like for pennies on the dollar, yep. we are demantling like the Russian military and we're out putting a single U.S. troop in harm's way. 
And you can look at the numbers, uh, 7,000 tanks, 13,000 vehicles, something like 700 aircraft, 30 ships, all gone, taken off the board, right? But someone's like, hey, you ever actually seen any um, metrics for that pennies on the dollar worldview that your pro, you know, Ukraine aid people would have? I'm like, no, I actually haven't. So I, you know, I went and looked. I couldn't find any really good think tank report or anything public that actually tried to quantify just the the dollars spent versus like the return on that investment just from an equipment perspective. And as I was kind of looking at this, I was like, you know, this kind of cuts both ways because we're we're pulling stocks, sending stocks to Ukraine, and then that money is going back to U.S. companies to build stocks. So it is propelling the defense industry forward to production lines and things like that. And so things that the, a lot of people haven't thought about in 20 or 30 years. Exactly. They're like the Stinger missiles is probably the one of my favorites. We had to go find the old retired people and bring them back and had to teach the new people how to put the things together because no one had done it for so right. long. But, you know, here's the other side of the coin. It cuts both ways. If Russia, their entire tank force has been destroyed, uh, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to design and build new tanks, just like their aircraft and our artillery. And so although we're dismantling the Russian military, we're also giving them like the entire reason to rebuild the military. And it's going to be, you know, better than it was. Well, I think that's a big question though. I, is it, I mean, like ideally, yes, but they are laboring under some serious sanctions and some serious supply issues for things like semiconductors and all the kind of stuff that need to go into building a modern army, right? Like if you're saying, oh, well, they're getting rid of, you know, Soviet era, Soviet, Soviet era tanks because they're running out of tanks and they're going to rebuild them with, you know, much more advanced fighting machines, whatever that is in, in 2030, 2040. It's not at all clear to me that they're going to have the resources or ability to do that, at least not quickly, at least not quickly enough to keep up with its kind of competitors. But I think it's a great point. And I, I actually would even go a bit further and say, I think it is clear, but I don't think the political argument has been made compellingly by people who support the position that you just put out there, that why America should be involved in Ukraine at all. Why, why is it in America's interest to fight Russia? Arguably, and this is what, this is what you know, some people in politics are saying, there's not been a compelling, clear slogan idea that Reagan was so good at in the, in the Cold War and that, you know, plenty of politicians have been good at since then. What's the key interest that America has in helping Ukraine fight Russia other than vaguely like Russia did a bad thing and, and that's not the world we want to live in, which is true. Because I think the arguments you're making about how much money goes in and return on investment, obviously that, that cold kind of analytical way of looking at this stuff, that's all downstream from the overarching argument of why are we even bothering at all? Yeah. Um, and I, and I have a very clear view on that, uh, but I don't think- I'd love to hear it. What's, uh, what's John Fowler's sake? Well, I think it's all the stuff that we were saying before, which is that America's superpower is showing up for its friends and for defending its allies and for defending the world order that it's built, that it has, let's be very clear about this, been the chief beneficiary of a rules-based kind of globalizing world. It's allowed America to move through the ranks of richest- countries that have ever existed on the planet ever arguably when you look at just demographics like it's it's the rule-based order has allowed allowed the united states to have a massively outsized influence absolutely. based on its like based on like its footprint demographically and geographically absolutely absolutely so that, yeah so there there is a bill to pay for that and exactly and and it's not free but it's again, pennies on the dollar for the benefits that America has kind of reaped over the last 80 years, right? Yeah. That, that's the first argument. And the second argument is that anything that is good for Russia is good for China and we shouldn't want anything that is good for China. And I don't mean that kind of like that China and Russia have lots of differences. So there'll be folks out there who know a lot about this and they'll say, oh, that's not true. They hate each other. And, that, and that's true. But if, if, if a Russian version of how it sees the world, i.e. that part of the world is ours, we're going to take it back because traditionally we can find documents from buddy Peter the Great or Ivan the Terrible or someone back in the back in the day saying, "Oh, that part of that part of the world is Russia's, and we get the right to take it back because we're stronger than you." If that's the worldview that gets that is allowed to prevail without anyone pushing back or with only Ukraine pushing back, then China will do the same. 
that was the strategy that Putin had when he did the Tucker Carlson interview. Absolutely. It was. Yes. He's like, I'm going to walk you through the last five centuries or whatever it was of Russian history to 100%. tell you why that's my land. For my sins, when they invaded in 2022, I went very, very deep on all these telegram channels of all these Russian ultra nationalist thinkers and their arguments for that stuff. And it really is stuff that you see, and you see it in China. We talked about the nine dash line. They dug up a map from 70 years ago yeah. about whatever. And I was just reading the other day, a think tank piece about how Xi Jinping has put a real kind of thrust into the efforts of archeology span in China and, and uh, mm. anthropology in China to tell a story of China that goes back 5,000 years and positions China as the cradle of human civilization and shows how China has been at the core of the world's kind of develop, human development. China and Africa are the two places where all of that started. And that sounds like, oh, very good. He's funding the sciences. He's funding cultural things. But what he's trying to do is exactly what you just said about what Putin did. And it's build this narrative of a Chinese claim to something more than the modern understanding of a nation state, right? So like modern understanding of a nation state is like, they can't have the Ch South China Sea. Oh, but we've been around for 5,000 years and we are the core of everything. Therefore, we have these things that we, you know, actually North Vietnam is actually traditionally the home of these people who have always been Chinese. Taiwan obviously is a, is a, is a no-brainer for them. So if you don't push back against this narrative, this idea that you can find a document from some past time and that means it's yours. It happens all over the world. And and that that breaks down the global world order. And that's bad for America. That's bad for anybody who believes in kind of freedom and democracy and small government, uh, free market economics, that kind of worldview. The problem is, Mike, is that no one has been able to put that into a three-line pithy saying at a rally where everyone chants it back. Like, what is that political message that makes all of that stuff that we just talked about easily comprehensible to someone in Kansas who's busy and just wants to know why the hell his taxpayer dollars or her taxpayer dollars should be going to Ukraine? And, and that's the key, I think. I mean, you can point to something domestically that is a bigger pain point that you see, like build the wall, fund the border. Exactly. And you can't explain in that many words why that money needs to go somewhere else it, it becomes it becomes hard right but it turns out like national security and diplomacy it's not easy right it's it's wickedly complex and this is why there's phds in this stuff and this is why we have elected officials with armies of well-informed well-intentioned people that are just focused on this type of stuff absolutely i don't pretend to to oversimplify stuff into a bumper sticker and say like, we did it guys. We, we did it in five words. <laughs> mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, the gift that keeps on giving that banner. Oh, exactly. man. <laughs> we're about out of time. So let's do this. Let's put a pin. Uh, we're going to talk about the Houthis a little bit. Uh, let's put a pin into that because that's evolving by the hour even yeah. right now as we're recording this. So, the next time we'll have to have you back on table stakes is we have to keep talking about China because it's China, China, China. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, we'll pick up and see what's going on in the red sea. How's that sound? That sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm game whenever you are. I, I, I love chatting with you. Like it's fantastic. Yeah. And for, for those of you that are uh, still following along, this is like broccoli. Okay. We usually talk about defense technology and programmatic stuff in the Pentagon, but th like this is the broccoli. So, we're gonna we're gonna keep having John on until uh, until you guys yell at me and uh, you know what I'm still gonna have him on. Uh, it's your choice. You Hopefully they like watch, broccoli. So. I I I'm, I feel like that's uh, that's a divisive vegetable. But anyway, maybe I'm divisive. That is a divisive vegetable. This is like uh like your vitamins. There you right? go. It's your vitamins on. You get it's good for you. You you need a you need a well balanced meal. <laughs> okay, um, John, where can people find international intrigue and where can people connect with you on social media? Yeah. So I always say the easiest way is just to Google international intrigue because then the list of all of our stuff comes up straight away. So you've got the website, which is internationalintrigue.io. You can go and subscribe to the newsletter there and uh, free five minutes. Um, I think you know we're, we're putting decades of kind of experience into, into each edition. So uh, I think people will enjoy it. Um, on social media, we're all over the place, but I'm um, at John's Nonsense on Twitter. I'm not as active as I used to be, but still there. 
and we are on Instagram and and LinkedIn as well. Uh, and actually, one one thing that folks might enjoy is our managing editor, a former colleague of mine who was a diplomat in the Australian Foreign Service, served in in Mexico and Peru and LA. Actually, he has a he has his personal Instagram account where he he's really built up a following of diplomatic memes. His handle is at Dickerpix because his last name is Jeremy Dicker. So. Great, firstly, a great handle. Oh man, if you type that in wrong, I know, right? Could, so make yeah. sure you get the D I C K E R P I C S. But he's on Instagram, <laughs> and uh, I, I tell you, he he punches out fantastic memes that uh, even if you haven't served in a foreign service, if you've served in government or I imagine a branch of the armed forces, there's probably a ton of the stuff about bureaucracy that's going to make you chuckle. So give that a look as well. Oh, I'm definitely going to look it up as soon as we get off the uh, get off air here. <laughs> That's good. I'll put a link to all that stuff in the show notes for everyone else who's listening or watching at home. John, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. I always enjoy learning a lot from you. We'll have to have you back on uh, very soon. I'd love that, Mike. It's always a pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. And that's it. We'll see you.